days, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the side uh, in the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, uh, came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here, put your finger and see my hands and reach here and your, your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. Let's go back to verse 19. On the evening, uh, that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Um, okay, so Sally and I's favorite joke, a skeleton walks into a bar and he orders a beer and a mop. <laughs> Just think about that picture for a minute. So Jesus's body we don't, we don't really have a great concept of what Jesus' body. He just walked through a wall, and he's actually going to participate in eating food, okay? Which tells me that Jesus's, and I believe the bodies that we are going to have, uh, our glorified bodies, are going to be really, 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 really cool. Um, because we're going to be able to eat stuff, we're also going to be able to pass through stuff. And I just think that's cool, because... You know, I'm sure that heaven is full of chocolate and things like that. I would hate to think I'm going to get to heaven and there's, you know, sorry, Mike, we don't eat up here because you're, you know, you just, no, it's not like that at all. It's not, it's not less than the experience we're having here on earth. It's more than the experience we're having on earth. You are a spiritual being having a physical experience and eventually you're going to be a spiritual being having a spiritual experience experience. And it's going to be really, really awesome. We think as spiritual as being that thing that you can see through and physical being that thing you can't see through. I think it's the opposite. I think physical is temporary. Spiritual is permanent. Permanent can pass through temporary. Temporary cannot pass through permanent. Okay? So our, our, our glorified bodies are going to be really, really awesome. And Jesus is kind of showing it. Now, I don't think that Every wound and every scar that we have um, are going to be on our glorified body. Because you think about some people have been scarred pretty bad in, in life. Some people have, you know, uh, you know I, I, would, I would like to think that all the disciples whose heads were cut off are not walking around with their heads under their arms. They're put back together. But Jesus' body was a special modification because Jesus wanted the guys to be able to see there's holes here and there's a hole here. And there are holes down there. And he literally wants Thomas, like, Thomas, go ahead, buddy. Stick your, stick your fingers in there. Put your hand up in there. Now, Jesus doesn't have any blood because he's powered by spirit. You and I are powered by blood. I think our spiritual bodies are powered by spirit, not by blood. Again, this is just what I think and what, I, what I've read. Um, everybody can have their own opinion. Get out of my car, get in another car. We're all in the same, we're all in the same ferry going the same place. So here we are. Um, Jesus has walked in. He's done something pretty amazing. The disciples are hiding, and I think I would be too. The man that I've committed my life to, three, the last three years of my life, I, I, whatever, whatever my motivation was, they took him and they brutally killed him. And now I don't want him to come and get me thinking, well, let's make the point. You know, and if we, we've killed him, now if we kill some of his disciples, that'll really put a stop to this whole thing. And they're hiding, they're in fear. Here's a cool thing. How many of you all know that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of really understanding the way things run. When you fear God, you need not fear anything else. I love that line in uh, the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe where, where she asks, is Aslan, is Aslan uh, sa um, safe? And no, he's not safe, but he's good. See, we serve a God who's not safe, but he's good. And he's on our side, or more appropriately, we're on his side. 
And uh, I, just, I just think it's just incredible when we stop and we realize that, you know, can, can, can people hurt us? Yes, people can hurt us. But, but we, we serve the king of the universe. We serve the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. All they can do to us is, is mess with our body. But the part of us that is real and is, is permanent, they can't touch that. It is untouchable because it's in the hand of the Father. Um, I just get this picture of, of this big, big father wrapping his arms around his little child. It's like, you ain't getting that child because I've got my arms wrapped around that child. So in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31, verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Christian, when will God leave you or forsake you? But what about, but what about, but what about when you, okay, so he'll never forsake you. So if he's with you, is his power with you? If he's with you, are you protected by him? Yes. So once we have a proper fear of God. Now, look, I know that a lot of people, and, and I love Francis Chan does this thing about the fear of the Lord. Um, Fear, fear, I don't believe that in, in the scripture that fear is a, a healthy respect. Because the angels come, fear not. Don't have a healthy respect. Okay, so if we're going to say fear is healthy respect, when, he, when God tells us, or Jesus says, do not be afraid, then he's saying, do not have a healthy respect. It's not what it means. What it means is, the thing that can just think and I will cease to exist just walked in the room. That's a little unnerving. But because I know I'm with him and he's with me, I no longer have to be unnerved by that or anything else. I can have the peace of God. And that, that takes us to our next scripture, which says, um, Isaiah 9 and 6, uh, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, this word peace is uh, the Greek word, and I'll try to pronounce it. It's uh, araana, araana. It means national tranquility. Jesus just walked in and said, guys, I just came from the Father. You guys are at peace now. Peace treaty's been signed. You are no longer enemies of God. You are at peace with God. Now, that's different than coming in and going, hey, everybody, shalom. Hey, everybody, it's all right. Be, be, it's all right. He's literally coming in and pronouncing over them, hey, guys, this is the first time I've talked to you since I was with the Father. And he said to tell you, you are at peace with him. Christians, you are at peace with God. And God is at peace with you. Man, God is just, God is just at war with me. God is not at war with you because he's at peace with you. And people who are at peace with other people do not go to war against them. So, um, the peace is shalom peace. Uh, uh, there is a peace that is a shalom peace. When Jesus enters the room with this big news, um, he is giving him uh, a different type of, uh, of, of welcome. Verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They weren't overjoyed when they saw his hands and his side, the wounds. They were just overjoyed because finally it was, this is real. This is real. I, I'm touching him. He's not a ghost. In one, of the, in one of the gospels, it says they were afraid because they thought he was a ghost. Well, guess what? He, all of a sudden, they're patting him, and he's hugging them, and he's, they're, they're interchanging inter, uh, uh, love and, and pats and all this other stuff, and they realize this is good. And they were overjoyed um, when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I get the picture here of how God created Adam in the garden and he created him out of the clay of the earth and then he breathed life into him. 
And uh, this is much the same thing. But at this point, Jesus has promised, I'm going to come back. I'm going so that the comforter will come back and will come and be with you at all times and all places. And so I'm going to breathe him into you. And at that point, the Holy Spirit enters everybody who is in that room who was, uh, who was the disciple of Jesus. And that's what happens to us when we uh, pray and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes into us. We do, it's interesting, and I'm, I'm dealing with this, and everybody, you know, you are wherever you are in this, in this uh, learning curve. Um, apparently, the power of the Holy Spirit did not come in at this particular time. The power of the Holy Spirit comes in later. Um, I'm reading a really good book right now. It's called the, the Fundamentals of the Holy Spirit. It's by Randy Clark. It's, it's really, really good. Um, and a lot of, I've, I've been taking a lot of things out of it. Um, and I, like I said, I'm learning. And I, if nothing more, I am willing to learn about things that I used to think one way. And now I realize, well, actually, no, maybe this is the right way. But the Holy Spirit, this is the first time for this group of people in a wholesale group of people, we're going to see the Holy Spirit just breathed out on these people. I think the Holy Spirit has been present off and on through the Old Testament. Anytime we see somebody be able to, was filled with the Spirit and prophesies this, or was filled with the Spirit and does this, was filled with the Spirit and does this, it's a, it's a temporary time when the Holy Spirit has come in and dwelled somebody and then left. But for us, it's not a temporary thing, it's a permanent thing. And he comes and he fills us and then... We, we have other benefits that come through that. So, uh, verse 23, if you forgive anyone's sin, uh, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Okay, question. Does this mean that those 11 plus people that were in that room that received Jesus, received the Holy Spirit, were disciples of Christ, now they have the ability to go around and go, I forgive your sins, I do not forgive your sins. I forgive your sins. I do not forgive your sins. If there are, there are people who believe that that's ex- actually what it's saying there. I don't believe that's what it's saying. What I believe it's saying there is that now you have the ability to help people know, yes, you have had a life-changing belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can know that you are saved. We all know that there are people who will go, well, you just can't know. But according to this, apparently you can know. And how you find this out is through other people who do know, and you begin to see, the, the, you begin to see a person's commitment to the Lord, their confession of their faith, their confession in their life, the belief that's changed the way they literally are living, um, like uh, the, the, the Philippian jailer. He, he believed in Jesus and was saved. He believed, and it changed the way he did business in the world. That is a life-changing belief. So, again, I, I just, uh, Jesus, Jesus could have uh, said that a different way, but that's how he said it. So, you can know, if you believe in a life-changing way that Jesus is the Messiah and you profess him as your Lord and Savior, you can know that you are redeemed. Um, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So a lot of people think the word Didymus actually means doubter. But Didymus means twin. Now how many of you all know that Joan and Peter are part of a triplet? They broke up the set so that we could have two of them. Your brother lives in California? Oregon. Oregon. Okay. So, how many of y'all knew that? Yeah, they're cool. See? Joan, Peter, and then your brothers? James. Because Joan was telling me it was going to be Peter, James, and John, but she's a Joan, so it's Peter, James, and Joan. So, now... So who was, who was Tom, Thomas's twin? Was it one of the other disciples? Was it this person? Was it that person? We have no way of knowing. I mean, I, I take for granted that when Peter tells me that there's another person that looks a whole lot like Peter out there, I'm just going to take his word for it that he has, another, he has another sibling that was born at the same time as him and has the same birthday and, and all that stuff. We don't know who Thomas's brother was, his twin brother was, or twin sister. All we know is that he was a twin. Now, one of the sermons that I listened to said, I think I'm his twin. 
because I'm the one who's going, I'm just not sure I believe this. I just, I'm going to have to see this. I'm from the show me state. I got to see it to believe it, you know? Maybe, maybe that's the point. It's 